Okay. Uh, I thought we'd start this time by just seeing if you've got any questions on any of the material from section 3.2. And so we'll finish off that with any questions and answers on that. And then we'll move on to uh, section 3.3 on linear math. So, anybody have any questions that came out of section 3.2? How about this uh, easy exercise showing that if a linear subspace of a norm space has a non-empty interior, that it must be the whole space? Were people able to do this exercise? Would anyone like to see some details of that exercise? Yep. Yeah, so quite popular that one. Okay, let's prove the uh, let's prove that one. So this is the solution to the exercise on linear subspaces with non empty interior. So, we've got a norm space E norm over F, which is R or C, and let F be a linear subspace. Of E suppose that the interior work E and E of F is non empty. We prove that F equals E. That, um, and the main thing is we'll start by proving that zero is in the interior of F respect to E and we'll quantify it somehow. So we start by... Okay, so let X then be in the interior respect to E of your subspace F. Then X is in your subspace and some ball in E, centre around X, is also in your subspace. So then, there exists an R greater than naught, so that the ball in E, centred on X, radius R, is contained in F. So far, that's just the definition of the interior. Notice the ball is taken in E, so that's an ordinary open ball in E. Now, we can translate by minus x, noting that uh, note that y goes to y minus x maps f to f because x is in f. You can translate that whole ball that the ball in E centred on zero radius R is contained in F. What did I do? If you translate every point of a particular open ball by minus X, I've just moved every point of the open ball the same, uh, the same way, translated it. It stays inside F because they're in F to start with and F is closed under subtraction of little x because x is in the left. So does that, is that bit clear, or anybody, any questions about this bit? Yep. 
If you take a ball centered to dot x radius r and you translate it by minus x, you definitely get the ball centered on zero radius little r. So that's OK. And since every point in the first ball is in f, and since x is in f, when you subtract x from everything, you get these points, and they're still in f. So now, let's take any point in E. Then to the boring case, if z is 0, then z is in f. Which is a good start. Otherwise, um, note that 1 over norm z times z um, has norm 1. And then if you put r over norm z, you'll get something of norm r. So that's got norm 1. And r over 2 norm z times norm z, if you look at the norm of that, is equal to r over 2, which is smaller than r. So that element is in your little ball centered on the origin radius r. What did I do? I scaled it down by, I'm probably scaling by a very small constant to pull it down into the open ball center R in E, radius R, but that is the subset of F. So R over 2 norm Z, norm Z is in F. Try that again. R over 2 norm z times norm times z is in f. And finally, so that's a typical point of E, apart from 0. So I want to show that z is in f. What do I do? What sort of a set is f? f is a, a linear subspace, right? So I can multiply by scalars, reals or complexes, depending. But definitely, I can multiply by real scalars for sure. Since uh, R is a subset of F, I'm saying that the real numbers are contained in the complex numbers for the purposes of this. Um, uh, sorry, F with, a, with the bold. This is the field F. Right, that's the scalars. We're allowed to use real scalars. Um, Z is equal to 2 norm Z over R times R over 2 norm Z. Z is also in F. And we show that every point of E is in F. So this is exactly what I said you needed to do. You start with an open ball somewhere in F. You translate it and you find that there's an open ball in E centered on the origin, which is contained in F. But now all the points of E can be scaled down, if necessary, uh, and pulled down uh, and brought down to be inside the ball, um, and then scaled back up again to give themselves back again. So that, that does it. Any questions about that proof? So it's quite hard for a linear subspace to have non-empty interior. It's got to be the whole thing. OK, and as far as I'm concerned, that's the end of section 3.2, unless you've thought of any more questions relating to that. OK, we'll move on to the sectional linear maps now.